An Englishman can't really start his day until he's had a good, honest brew. There's no other tea to be PG. It's a taste. Oh, Grey, red berries, lemon and ginger, peppermint infusion. Do you know, why doesn't anybody just have one called Builder's? In other words, nothing fancy. I'll go look elsewhere. I know in the film I've just made, the X-T3 has landed. I said good things come to those who wait, and today is a film that requires a little patience. I was wondering whether to make this at all, actually, because what happens at the end is not quite what you'll expect, and it's really one aimed at photographers who have or will get asked to photograph what convention may describe as the unusual. Well, it's not exactly Bondi, but uh, it's Southwold. So I'm staying at this uh, this lovely English hotel just across from the waters here and uh, they don't start serving breakfast till 9.30. How English! So I thought I'd come out and take a little jaunt down the beach of a place I used to holiday a lot with my, my parents. It brings back so many fond, happy memories, this amazing, quaint English town on the, the Suffolk coast. So I'm going to tell you a few stories about it, then I'm going to tell you what I'm doing today and what my job is today, because it's an unusual photo job. It's an extremely unusual photo job. Um, let me show you around this place first though. It's funny how we can remember things that uh, happened to us 35, 40 years ago. I can't sometimes remember what we had for, for dinner last night, but I remember distinctly being here all those years ago. And we came down to the beach and there was this, this big to-do happening just behind me here in the bay. The, the waves had really ripped up. It was a, a stormy day and out on that storm was um, was a, a small dinghy with uh, a load of kids on it the dinghy was clearly sinking it was it was going down and um, racing out from just across the way just out the bay here and behind me came the rnli the lifeboat and they went to these kids and they rescued them they they actually pulled them into shore and as the dinghy arrived back into shore this uh, rusty old blue land rover i remember it i remember it so well i remember the rust around the around the wheel arches turned up on the beach and this father jumped out and took uh, his son, one of the, the children from the boat, and plonked him in the Land Rover in the front seat. And as he got in the other side, he gave him a good clip around the ear roll and, and told him off. And I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I, I don't understand. Why, why is he being so angry with his son? He's just rescued him from the water. And uh, my dad looked at me and he said, Son, you'll, you'll never understand until you've had children. This is Bailey's Bridge. If we made it this far, I knew we were halfway towards our destination and the ice cream. Of course, we had to stop along the way quite a lot for twitching, bird watching, rock and roll. It's easy to get lost in the, the melee of, of travel videos about Thailand and, well, I've just made one in Australia and other exotic places like that. And you forget about the places that are on your doorstep, the, the ones that really mean something to you, that, that your childhood was really in some, in some way glued to, pinned to, and, and Southwold is one of those places for me, and it's, it still has a, a vibrant fishing industry. It still has a proper fish and chip shop, a proper brewery, a lighthouse, um, a pier. Seaside town fact. As you walk along any street that's right next to the sea in a seaside town, the one thing you, you notice more than anything else, next to the sound of gulls and the shore lapping, or the sea lapping on the shore rather, is the, um, the smell of bacon and egg from all the B&Bs. Everybody has their favourite pier and uh, this one is, is mine and it's based on my childhood. Yeah, I've been to Brighton and I've been to Blackpool, a bit garish, but this one, Southwold, may not be the biggest, may not have the most amusements, but uh, it has soul. So the reason I'm, I'm here in Southwold, I've come to a slightly quieter place. Um, because I thought really sharing this next part of the story I wanted to be away from the marauding crowds dipping themselves in sub-zero temperature seas. Um, it's, it's because I'm here to, to photograph a, a unique event. I mean, I'm, I'm used to photographing reasonably unique events every week. I'm a wedding photographer, unashamedly a wedding photographer. But um, today I, I'm, I'm in this part of the world on the east coast of, of England to photograph something, well, it's an end of life story. It's a kind of a start of life and end of life story. 
Um, I, I'm photographing a funeral and I'm, I've never photographed a, a funeral before and this uh, so this very much is a, is a first it's for a, a young lad who died five days into his life and the parents had lost two children before and a similar sort of situation and and so I'm, I'm here to document the last hour or so of, of this lad being remembered as a coffin comes into a crematorium and I know straight away you're gonna say Phew, that doesn't sound like a bundle of laughs for this video Neil but I think it's important to realize this as documentarians as people that make photographs that documenting life and documenting the end of life is um, it's a pretty special privilege it's a very special privilege and that's what I'm here to do today so I, I'm I may not be able to show you the photographs I may not be able to share the the story as such I'm keeping an eye on that gull having made that video in, in Australia where I was dive bomb repeatedly by gulls so I may not be able to show you the full story I may not be able to show you all the photographs that I, I take today hopefully maybe I can share a few but um, it's a journey today it's 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 a photographic adventure it's 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 a unique opportunity to to make pictures and to make pictures at a time when somebody most needs photographs to be a part of that healing process well Leanne and Tom said yes to sharing so I'll start to roll some pictures and if you're inclined in any way to comment on what you see and consume here I'd like you to bear in mind that this is the kind of subject that won't clearly suit everyone's taste that's fine that's the way the world turns but in leaving comments, bear in mind people's feelings, not mine necessarily, but those for whom made this choice to share and initially invite a photographer into a situation that may seem somewhat unconventional. I think anyone with an ounce of compassion will appreciate how a small casket at a funeral can make you feel. As photographers, we're invited to make pictures with a, a broad brush in terms of subject matter. I've always admired the authenticity and the truthful spirit photographers in, say, famine or conflict scenarios manage to ply their craft. It can't be easy when you're not invested in a political cause to record the plight of those before you whose eyes say help, but you know you can't. I had an email sent to me from Leanne and Tom, Felix's mum and dad. The first sentence simply read, We lost our baby son at just five days old and we're in the early stages of planning a funeral. The rest I'll hold on to. Suffice to say, the request to travel nearly four hours in a car to a town close by to a place so important in my life as a boy was not one I was going to miss. Now, I'm a, a wedding photographer, and barring the occasional guest who requests otherwise, usually people are pretty happy to let me photograph them, even during emotional moments. So being asked to photograph a funeral, and one for an occasion such as this, had me, I've got to admit, a little concerned that A, if I'd be emotionally able to, and B, whether guests would find my presence disturbing in any way. We're just not used to a photographer being at a funeral in the UK, but if you think about it, it's one of the rare occasions where family comes together, united in cause, together in support. I was buoyed by Leanne's reasons for having me there. She wrote, It's really important to me that we have a, a record of this day. It's going to be an emotional one, but I know that having some photographs will help us process this in the future. Of course, there won't be an opportunity to make pictures at other events in Felix's life, and so I got it. I appreciated that these were pictures that could tell a story about the people whose lives he'd already touched, despite his short but exceptionally important life. I'm not going to mention an actual kit list. It's not a gear review. It wouldn't be appropriate. But I will say, mirrorless of whatever make you prefer offers you as a photographer the opportunity to be truly silent. No fuss, no clicks, and a smaller form factor. You're less obtrusive, though that doesn't mean hiding away. One thing I learned from this day is something I've gleaned from photographers who've worked on the front line and in countries where compassion is key to your storytelling and in some places, survival. Be close. Never be afraid of getting close. That doesn't mean marching up to someone with a 24mm lens and being brazen for the sake of the story. It also doesn't mean papping from 100 yards with a zoom telephoto. Nothing invites suspicion more than acting suspiciously. Being conspicuous and meeting people's eyes before you raise your camera can be key. I found a knowing, compassionate smile and then almost submissive drop of my eye line before theirs to be a, a sign of silently affirming, I know this is hard and I'm going to do my very best to observe that and respect you. 
Being close to the people whose story you are telling invites you not only into their narrative, but equally gains their trust, and working silently is another important part of that equation. In some countries, and some cultures, it's positively invited that people should make pictures at an event such as this. And if it is part of a healing process, then I think that's important. Anxious about the pregnancy, Tom and Leanne would often be awake in the early hours listening to tapes of Carl Pilkington's ramblings and poetry to help them sleep. They even joked that the baby would probably think that Carl was related to him. At the funeral, Leanne read one of Carl's short but quirky ramblings about jellyfish. And it seems an apt way to end this story. It's been a different one, but for photographers about to embark on telling a similar kind of story, or one that you feel is different to the social norm, fear not. People will let you in. Just be close, be patient, and above all, share your empathy. Jellyfish by Carl Pilkington. I don't like jellyfish. They're not a fish, they're just a blob. They don't have eyes, fins, or scales like a cot. They float about blind, stinging people in the seas. And no one eats jellyfish with chips and mushy peas. <laughs> Get rid of them. <laughs> thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Felix. We'll see you in the comments. Thank you.